Thanks, and I would like to start by thanking the organizers for giving me the opportunity to present uh, this work that I've been doing together with Gilly Eder and Nelson and Juan Yuxiao from the University of Washington, and which will be hopefully uh, in the archive in a few weeks. So the question that I'm trying to address is uh, the existence of the variant asymmetry in the visible universe, or said otherwise, to try to explain uh, or the origin of uh, the matter of which we are composed. Of course, this is an important enough question so that people have been theorizing about it for a very long time, but fortunately uh, there are some ideas which are more testable than others, and what today I would like to present is that perhaps we don't need such, such exotic physics to explain variogenesis, but uh, something as simple, well, slightly um, as simple as um, well understood as neutral meson oscillations uh, with just a few uh, tweaks might do the trick and this is something that was uh, studied in this paper and what uh, we're doing now is trying to find a more self-contained uh, framework in order to, to try to get an idea of what the flavor structure of the theory that can accommodate this looks like and as a byproduct we'll see that we can get a natural identification of the dark matter with a right handed neutrino uh, which means the scalar partner of the right hand neutrino. So very quickly, just to set the framework uh, in the supersymmetric model that we're dealing with, this is an R-symmetric model. That means that there's a global symmetry under which the supersymmetry generators transformate, and therefore also the superfields. But what's interesting is that the charge assignments can be made in a way so that this U1R symmetry can be identified with very number. And this is going to be important. Uh, another important point is that because of the R symmetry, Majorana Gigino masses are forbidden, uh, so that the fermionic superpartners of the gate bosons have to be Dirac. And in this case, uh, it's easier to make them light, and this is going to be important because the main phenomenology is going to be allowed by having a uh, Bino, so the superpartner, fermionic superpartner of the B gate boson at the GD scale. So let me go through the steps of the variogenesis scenario. Uh, with the focus on how the Sakharov conditions are satisfied. So the first one, the departure from uh, equilibrium, is achieved uh, by assuming that there's a scalar which decays late enough and produces B quarks between the QCD phase transition and BBN, and what happens is that -quark, these B quarks will hadronize into the mesons. And the neutral B mesons that are produced this way will, os will perform particle-antiparticle oscillations, uh, and we know that this happens in a of course, flavor violating, but also CP violating, violating way, and that's how we uh, can get the second Sakharov condition. At this point, it's important to note that the light Bino enhances the CP violation by means of these box diagrams, very similar to the standard model ones. So, after we have this CP violation, we generated it with the um, B meson oscillations, we have to lock it in into a variable number, and this is achieved when the B mesons decay into a baryon plus a dark anti -baryon. So this means that baryon number is not really globally violated, by, but rather the visible baryon asymmetry is compensated by an equal one with but the negative side uh, on the dark sector. So there's an overall apparent deviolation uh, in the visible sector, and that's how the third Sakharov condition is kind of circumvented. Uh, what's interesting in that is that Right-handed neutrinos, because of the charge assignments, have very number minus one, so we can identify these dark variants uh, with the right-handed neutrinos. They have all the suitable couplings for this decay to happen. So what's going on is that on top of periogenesis, uh, asymmetric right-handed neutrino dark matter is being produced. Of course, at this point, you might be wondering, well, how on earth is this not ruled out? Well, uh, it is not, but what's interesting is that it will uh, most likely be uh, in the next few years. What I'm going to say, what I'm saying is that this is a very testable scenario, and I think that's what's appealing. Uh, there are a lot of um, phenomenology, both particle physics and astrophysics. Uh, for instance, I'm highlighting here that we need a relatively large function ratio of P mesons into baryons plus missing energy, uh, or also that dark matter is not completely stable, but it can have this particular decay into anti, uh, into anti quarks and bright light neutrinos. So, with this, I come to my conclusions. I've been discussing how, uh, in this supersymmetric framework, uh, periogenesis 
and uh, red hat asymmetric dark matter, uh, red hat neutrino asymmetric dark matter can be produced through beam meson oscillations. And I think what's more appeal what's most appealing of this scenario is that it's very testable, uh, particularly with flavor and astrophysical observables. Mm, this is all I wanted to, th to say, so if you have any questions, I'll be happy to ask uh, and discuss with you at any point. Thanks. Since that CP violation is not in the decay of the scalar, but later in the oscillations among the beam emissions, that's right. So the beam emissions capture strong the equilibrium by by, you know, by by strong interactions. Oh, sorry, say again. I mean, the beam emissions are not. The beam emissions should be somehow out of equilibrium to, in order for an asymmetry to develop. Yes. So this happens because so we're producing uh, the big works late enough so that this is an out of, out of equilibrium process, right? So this is happening at tens of MeV temperature, uh, which is which uh, is a time when we would expect beamsons uh, to be appearing, and that's how uh, at the out of equilibrium condition is satisfied. Then after this, these big works hardenize, and it's in the oscillations where the CP violation is is produced. So it's kind of subsequent. Uh, lead. So of course, this is like the scalar is not decaying at one point in time, but it's uh, constantly decaying, and the oscillations are happening. So this is not a uh, yeah, systematic, uh, schematic. Okay, thank you. So next time, speaker. Thank you.